All right, everybody, welcome. Um, I'm Sam, I'm organizing the programming for the this year's uh, New York City Food Waste Fair. Um, this is our third biennial food waste fair. Um, and we have an exciting tour and Q&A ready for you today. So um, I just wanted to give people a few reminders. Um, First, I wanted to mention um, that there is a Q&A function um, affiliated with this, associated with this webinar. So please, please use the Q&A box to ask us questions. Um, I will be uh, showing this video as a virtual tour for about five minutes. We'll show a small clip. Um, I'll share that link to you all if you wanna check it out later. Um, and we will, uh, launch into some questions and would love to get into some of your questions about the uh, facility. Um, other reminders I have include checking out foodwastefair.com to look at the schedule of events for the rest of this week. The Food Waste Fair goes until the 19th um, and we hope to see you at some of those other events. Um, and lastly, I wanted to bring up the Food Waste Toolkit, um, which is a resource for New York City businesses and residents to learn about how they can reduce uh, their food waste. Um, and with that said, without any further ado, I would love to introduce Jennifer. Um, and I would love to hear a little bit about what you do, Jennifer, and then maybe we can jump into the video from there. Sounds great. Thanks, Sam. And thanks for um, your work in coordinating this program. <laughs> I know it's significant and it's a great benefit to, to the community and everyone who can attend. So thanks for that. Um, I'm Jennifer McDonald. I work for the Department of Environmental Protection here in New York City, uh, where I am the resource recovery program manager in our energy office. Um, one of the projects that I work on is our co-digestion program that we're gonna be talking about this morning. Um, New York City has 14 wastewater resource recovery facilities sprinkled throughout the five boroughs. We only do co-digestion at one of them, and that's Newtown Creek, um, the facility that we'll be taking a, a virtual tour of today, um, and is actually behind me. For those of you who can see, this is an, an aerial view of Newtown Creek, and those are the digester eggs that we'll be um, 
talking a lot more about in this session. Um, so the the video that um, we are were able to share um, is a video that DEP has prepared to help folks come and experience the facility sort of during COVID times. Uh, we generally love to have tours and we do a number of them at Newtown Creek. We have a visitor center. We do a lot of educational programming. And of course we've um, been limited uh, in the past year or so um, to be able to do that. So we have produced this video that we're gonna share a portion of it. The whole video is about 17 minutes. We decided not to show the whole thing because it's actually less focused or not at all focused on the food waste portion, but more focused on what an architectural and engineering marvel this wastewater treatment facility is. So if you're into that stuff, in addition to um, organics recovery, you know, we're going to make the, as Sam said, the link available so you can join the whole tour, but we're going to focus um, the, the portions of the virtual tour that we share on the infrastructure that's specifically related to co-digestion. Uh, and then we'll spend, I think, the rest of the time in this session talking about co-digestion um, and answering questions that um, participants might have about the program. Um, so just a little bit more about the program before we go into the video. Um, the program relies on partnerships um, in order to operate uh, a, a wastewater treatment facility. Most wastewater treatment facilities are liquid based. When you think about it, everything comes in uh, in water, as water, um, with water. <laughs> so it's the same for co-digestion. We need the food scraps to come in as a liquid. Uh, all of our infrastructure is based on pumps and flow. Um, so we have a partnership with waste management in New York City to produce a food waste slurry that comes to the digester. So although that's not covered in the video, uh, I wanted to be clear and we'll talk more about that after we watch the video. But um, right now, I think we'll, we'll switch to that and you'll be able to kind of see more on the ground level and from um, some remarks by one of my colleagues at DEP about the engineering infrastructure that's here in Brooklyn. All right, so let me share my screen and we'll get this going. So here we are on the west side of the plant. These are the aeration tanks and settling tanks, and this is where the wastewater is being treated. All right, so here, the heavier solids sink to the bottom and the lighter items float to the top, and both are removed. Then we introduce air to the process. And the air feeds these helpful bacteria that consume the dissolved organic waste that's in the wastewater. Once those bugs are sated, they also sink to the bottom and we scoop them out for further treatment. And again, this big pipe that runs along here, that's bringing the air from the main building um, into these aeration tanks. But the one that's running back closer to us is actually running to these vessels. These are our odor control vessels. You see we have many of them to control the odor at the plant. Between the batteries of the tanks, there are three similar structures. Two are control buildings for the tank, and the last is the disinfection facility. We'll see that in a little bit. These three structures are all clad in glazed white brick. They have clerestory windows that wrap all the way around underneath this swooping roof line. And that really echoes what we saw back at the main building with this sort of strict horizontality countered by this more curvilinear roof line. And here we are in front of the disinfection building. Back over that way, you can see the north control building over the battery of tanks. Here at the disinfection building, this is the one of the last steps for the wastewater. Here it's treated to make sure there are no harmful pathogens left in it before it's released clean into the East River. And behind me, you can even see in the distance the Empire State Building and the Chrysler Building. Looking east, these are the famous digester eggs. This is where sludge, that solid material that we removed from the aeration and settling tanks, is brought for further treatment. Let's take a walk a little bit closer. Now, if you've been to Greenpoint or have driven from Brooklyn to Queens, you might be familiar with these enormous egg-shaped domes. Their scale makes them visible from all around. And Polshek Capital 
eyes on that to make them an iconic piece of the skyline. These are clad in stainless steel, with a glass enclosed catwalk, observation deck, and lit in an ethereal blue at night. Or for very special occasions like a Valentine's Day tour, we light them up red. The eggs are a critical component of what we call the solids treatment process. The sludge is heated, mixed, and digested by anaerobic bacteria for several weeks. The end products are biosolids, which can be beneficially reused as fertilizers, and biogas, primarily methane, which is reused here on site to run our boilers. And soon, through a partnership with National Grid, biogas will be put back into the grid to provide green energy for the surrounding community. And remember, this plant is huge, so sometimes our workers get around on bicycle. Now the shape. You might think that this is pure architectural flight of fancy, but the shape is actually directly tied to their function. That ovoid shape actually continues and is mirrored at the bottom. It actually extends a little bit underground. And that allows for the sludge inside to be continuously stirred. This is an example of Polshek's architectural approach. A marriage of formalism and aesthetics, but also with a commitment to creating architecture that serves the public. Now we're gonna go up to the top. So let's go find the elevator. You'll be able to find it by that telltale green tile. We're gonna take the elevator because it's 11 flights up. The glass enclosed catwalk was dreamed up precisely as a way to provide access to the public for tours of the facility but it also serves a helpful operational function for us because it eases maintenance. We don't have to climb 11 flights of stairs. So we can walk all the way around here and get a 360 degree view. And this view basically encompasses the area that this facility serves, about 25 square miles of Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. And there's even an added treat. There's a little window over here that allows visitors to look down into the digesters and see this legend there. These digester eggs are really a monument to wastewater resource recovery, to every sewage worker who helps this great city of ours to run and to grow more sustainably each day. We're gonna head over to the support building next. All right, well, um, I just wanted to give that little teaser of this video. Um, I'm going to share in the chat with everyone this uh, virtual tour um, so that you can watch it all later. Um, didn't think we wanted to share a video for 17 plus minutes. Um, so I invite you all to watch this in your leisure. Um, it's, it's really interesting and I really hope to visit uh, Newtown Creek one day when we're doing in-person tours. Um, and I also wanted to share this Medium article that uh, Jennifer passed along to me before this uh, Q&A. Um, which gives you a little bit more of the background of uh, co-digestion and the actual process it, uh, itself. And so um, I invite you all to look at it later, but um, before- Yeah, it's pretty short. If you have, you know, internet access now, you could probably jump over to the Medium article. Um, if you're not familiar with co-digestion, it might be a good overview, um, but definitely available for widespread sharing and <laughs> enjoyment. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, so without having our attendees just kind of click over to the Medium article and read it now, um, could you give us a summary of, yeah. about co-digestion and what, what sets it apart from other forms of wastewater treatment? Absolutely. Um, before I do that, I will um, give a shout out to Alicia West, uh, who was our hostess in that last video. Um, she did a great job um, sort of explaining the architectural as well as the technical uh, aspect. So um, she didn't get a chance. We cut out her name. So I thought I should um, introduce everyone to Alicia. Um, and there actually was a little snippet of the video where you could see the co-digestion infrastructure, but she didn't point it out. When she, when she turned and was walking towards the large eggs, 
um, on her left hand side, there was like a little trailer building and, and a tank. Um, and that's what we use um, to introduce the food waste slurry into the digester eggs. So when we started the video, we were looking at the first stages of treatment, the settling and aeration that happens before digestion. And that's where the sewage um, and all the stormwater wastewater is coming into the plant and settling out and having biological activity. That's not where we put the food waste in. We actually add the food waste into what we call a wet well, which is basically uh, a hole in the ground with pumps that's filled with liquid. <laughs> and then we pump the sludge that comes from that um, preliminary and primary treatment into the digester eggs. And we inject the food waste slurry into that wet well. So they mix and then pump into the digester eggs together. Um, so there's infrastructure on site uh, where waste management after preparing the food waste slurry, um, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, uh, but they actually drive it on site in tanker trucks, load it into on site storage tanks, and then those storage tanks feed into the wet well into the digester eggs. So to back up a little bit um, and, and start from, I guess, the beginning, you know, food scraps around the city are segregated in many ways, right? People could be dropping things off in a brown bin, restaurants may be separating, maybe there's a grocery store that has a large dumpster. Um, the program is set up to actually be able to accept all those types of food scraps um, at Waste Management's transfer station in Brooklyn. There they have specialized equipment, they call it a core facility, um, where they clean up and slurry the food scraps into that pumpable liquid. And when I say clean up, um, what I mean is they have specialized equipment and a step-by-step -step process to take out things like plastic bags um, or contamination that may end up in there inadvertently. The equipment also homogenizes, you know, mixes it into a nice consistent um, pumpable liquid and screens out anything that might have also um, gotten in there that's not good for digestion, like pebbles um, or uh, rags or things like that. So they have all this equipment to make uh, the product there that then they drive over and then the DEP puts into a, the storage tank and then is pumped into the digester. So it's a pretty multi-step process. Um, and the Medium article has some nice images that help bring what I've just described uh, to a little more life. So yeah, there we go. That's the, <laughs> that's the food waste smoothie. Uh, yeah, which, you know, sometimes my smoothies look like that, but um, I don't, I hope they taste a little bit better than that probably tastes. But um, yeah, I mean, that's the idea is that we make it into this pumpable slurry that um, is added into that frothy mixy digester and the digesters because they're so huge um, there's a term in engineering or in wastewater treatment that we use to talk about how long material stays in the digester we call that retention time um, and because we have so much space each of those digester eggs is 3.1 million gallons um, the solids or you know the material stays in the digesters from 30 to 45 days um, so it's actually in there for quite a long time um, and that's where those methanogens and other microorganisms um, in the absence of oxygen that's why we call it an anaerobic digester are able to convert um, the carbon in the, the food waste into um, methane and that's what we recover as a, a biogas so yeah um, a lot happening uh, inside those eggs. And, you know, co-digestion is something that the wastewater industry has been doing, I'd say for about 10 to 15 years now. Um, digestion of sludge, on the other hand, has been going on for for decades, maybe even a century. It's not a new technology, anaerobic digestion for the treatment of sewage. It's very common. Um, many large cities around the country have digesters for their sewage. The addition of the outside food food waste or feedstock as some people sometimes call it. Um, that's been going on for about 10 or 15 years. And when I first started working in organics recovery about that long ago, digestion was very new um, as a method to manage food waste. Um, so this is certainly, New York was a bit of a pioneer in, in having this program, um, but more and more we're seeing co-digestion happen at, at different municipal facilities around the country. 
Yeah, so I was wondering if you could give us, um, I know we've got little bits, snippets of like the process of co-digestion, but can you walk us through like more high level of how the, the food scraps get converted to an energy product? Yeah, so they, the food scraps would be separated and collected, right? Um, either at the brown bin program or at the, the grocery store and then delivered um, in their solid form um, to the waste management transfer station. And that's where they're produced into the slurry. Uh, and then the slurry is delivered to Newtown Creek, put into the digester. And then the digestion process, that actual um, microorganism activity is what converts the food scraps into the biogas or energy. What's left over um, is called a digested sludge or a biosolid. And then that is actually shipped uh, out of Newtown Creek to another facility to, to be dewatered. And then we get the biosolid. So um, it's a pretty complicated process, um, but all along the way, you know, there are different specialized um, people um, whether it's waste management and equipment, uh, they're happy, ha helping each of the steps uh, come together to make the program work. Um, and where does most of these food scraps and the feedstock actually come from um, besides yeah. the brown bins? Yeah, well, we were getting some of the brown bin stuff before the program was stopped, and we're hopeful that when it comes back, we'll, we'll see some more of that. Um, but since the program has been on pause, uh, most of the material has been coming from commercial generators like grocery stores, less restaurants too, although we had more of those before the pandemic just because of the impact the, um, that that's had on the, um, you know, industry and, and the waste sector. Um, we did also prior to the pandemic, and this is another program that we're really uh, hopeful to see return and hopefully maybe even expand is the zero waste schools. Um, so the schools that are participating in organics diversion, you know, separating their um, materials, some of them um, based on, you know, routing and proximity, um, some of them might end up contributing food scraps to this program. So what kind of waste is most ideal for digestion? And like, what kinds of issues do you really run into when you're collecting the waste for digestion? Yeah, so digestion is about the energy conversion, right? That's what makes it really attractive is we can make this renewable biogas. Um, and what makes more gas are things that are higher in energy content. So when you think about things like fats or uh, sweets or carbohydrates, things that are have complex carbon uh, molecules that can convert into methane. Um, things like fruits and vegetables aren't as energy rich, but they're still fine to digest because in fact, those are mostly water and we can recover the water as well, right? As, as we were kind of seeing at the beginning of the video, um, the wastewater resource recovery facility has two primary, well, three, if we count the biogas outputs, we have clean water, we have biosolids and we have renewable energy. So um, when we digest food scraps, we get the most energy from things that are high energy, just like we think about eating like fats and oils. Um, and then we get water back from things like fruits and vegetables. So um, everything has its own, you know, our, um, again, our industry is very engineering focused, but we have graphs that show like how much energy based on type of food waste. So, you know, um, fruits and vegetables are down low, proteins are in the middle, carbohydrates and fats have the most energy. Um, but we can um, accept sort of all, all those types of food scraps. Um, and that's the beauty of the pretreatment and the, the core function at Waste Management's transfer station is they will blend those things all together because you never really want to feed a digester too much of one thing. Um, they like to have a more balanced diet like humans. So to be able to, to mix things together and make a, a, a consistent slurry is um, really one of the things that makes the program work. But to sort of, and some of the challenges, that was the other part of your question. Um, and maybe that's best answered with what's not so good for um, co-digestion and that's like leaf and yard waste. So woody biomass, trees, leaves, those are better composted. They don't have a lot of energy value and they're pretty dry, right? And when we're thinking about the fact that this um, system is a liquid system, um, we want things that are able to be slurried and pumpable. So leaves and trees, not so much, <laughs> um, yeah. 
So to that point, is composting uh, a competitor to di digestion? No, they're actually quite complementary um, in the sense that if we look at the all the universe of organic materials that are available, some could be better for digestion and some could be better for composting. Um, but at the same time, we compost some of the biosolids that come out of the treatment process at the end. So in that way, they can actually be complementary. Um, I think there's a perception sometimes that, um, you know, we don't have a lot of food waste, but that's really not true, right? Like there's plenty of food waste to go around. So um, unfortunately, I think the main objective, right, is to get up the hierarchy and to reduce the amount of food waste that we have. Um, and I know that a lot of the programming in this series is focused on that, which is fantastic. Um, so we'd really like to mostly see food waste, right? Things like that can't be eaten, um, diverted for digestion or composting. But even if we did that, um, what's really unique about our program is that it's right here in the city. You know, we have this the capacity, and we've already invested in the infrastructure um, to be able to recover um, material right here in New York without having to um, ship it outside the city. Um, and then my last couple of questions are specific to New York and having a wastewater digestion system in New York. So what kind of capacity does New York actually have and how does it really make sense for a city like New York where, you know, real estate is, is an issue yeah. and, um, you know, collection is an issue. So how does it make sense for New York? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, um, what we're fortunate to have in this right here, right, is we've already invested in this infrastructure. It exists. And because, as I mentioned, those digester eggs are huge. Um, we're not using all the capacity we have in them. And in fact, we are seeing even less sewage because of the pandemic. Um, there are less people coming to Manhattan. And so we have even more space right now um, in the digester eggs. Um, but the the system was built to have a throughput of 250 tons of food scraps a day. So that's, you know, on paper, how much we can um, process or accept. Um, we're only using a fraction of that now. Um, and the pandemic really had an impact on that. We, we got up to about a high of 200 a little bit more before the pandemic, but we're down between 50 and 75 tons a day. So there's available capacity um, today to add more to, to add more food scraps. More long term and thinking, um, you know, broadly about the city as a, you know, an, an entity with waste management challenges um, and energy challenges. Um, the team that I'm a part of at DEP, the Energy Office, we're in the middle of a energy and carbon neutrality plan for the whole agency. So we're looking across the system at all of our 14 treatment plants to assess where we might do co-digestion in addition to Newtown Creek. Because we, we do have some space here, but from a long-term perspective, um, we think that there's probably more capacity we could use that's already built or going to be built. Um, so that's something that we're taking a look at now. And I think we'll hear more about in the next couple of years. Um, and, uh, we're really interested in watching what happens with things like the commercial waste zones and the brown bin program right to see like where where are we going to start seeing more food waste come out of the the waste stream because i think that's one of the biggest challenges right now is actually getting people to segregate food waste or helping businesses to find a way to make space to collect it separately right so that it can be um diverted um those are certainly challenges that are, you know, kind of outside the scope of what DEP is involved in, but we're certainly aware of how they can impact the ability for these programs um, to be optimized, right? To use the space that we have um, and make as much energy as we can. All right, well, let's start moving towards the audience q and I saw one come in that actually has to do with what we were just talking about and that question was, what would need to change for the city to be able to di divert more scraps and waste to use all of the facility's capacity? Yeah, uh, I don't know. That's a tricky one because the way the city has approached this, um, and we, I don't know if we covered this, but I think it's good to add maybe at this point that this program has been about 10 to 12 years in the making, right? So we started out with pilot scale 
projects to prove out the concept could work. We slowly moved up to, you know, I think we started maybe with like five tons a day. Very, it sounds maybe a lot, but in the scope of, you know, the amount of throughput at Newtown Creek, it was really small. And in fact, when we first started adding food waste at that level to the digester, we didn't notice, like we couldn't tell that it was there because um, we, we have so much, uh, wastewater solids in there that it was a, a pretty small percentage. But in any event, the program really started ramping up around 2016 to 2019. Those were when we started to see the trends of like 7,500, 200 tons a day being diverted. Um, so what would it take to get back to that level? I think having the brown bin come back is going to be a really big part of that. Um, and getting people to participate, right? Because it's going to be voluntary. So how do we make sure that we get the most participation in that and getting the zero waste schools back will be great. And then I also think, you know, commercial waste zones will play a part in it. But one other thing is that's why I'm here today is because we also are acknowledging that maybe don't people don't know enough about this option as a food waste recovery method. So we're trying to spread the word, um, help connect the dots on people who could help divert more, whether it's, you know, waste management, making connections with a company that wants to participate and being able to set up that trucking logistic or answering questions for someone who wants to learn more about digestion. That's part of, you know, that's why we're here today is we want to help get more um, use of that capacity. That's awesome. Um... Yeah, I'm excited for the brown bin program to start back up for folks. Um, the next question I have is actually going to be a combination of a couple of the questions I'm seeing that have to do with the actual products of digestion. Yeah. So first, um, people have questions about the uh, the end product. Mm -hmm. um, like, what is the end product um, after the energy has been recovered, and what are the markets for that material? What becomes of those biosolids, and then what also happens to the CO2 that's produced during digestion and is it harnessed for energy? Yeah, um, all really good questions. Um, so when the, what's it, oh, maybe I'll start by saying like, this is a continuous process digestion. It's not a batch process. So we don't fill up one egg, let it sit there for 45 days and then empty it. We're sort of, it's in and out all the time in and out, in and out. So, so we call that a continuous process. But so, and, and the mixing is very important because that's how you ensure that sort of the newer stuff gets in and gets to stay there and gets gobbled up um, by the bugs um, as intended. Um, but at any event, when it's time for some to leave the digesters, it actually goes, and we saw this in the video, the two tall um, tanks in between each of the eggs, those are the storage tanks. So when the 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 co-digestion liquid so it's in the digesters at about six percent solids uh, you might think about that as the consistency of like chocolate milk um, so when it's done digesting half about half of those solids have been converted into the biogas so it's only about three percent solids um, when it's done digesting and then it goes into those storage tanks and then we pump those storage tanks onto a marine vessel. So uh, a, a, it's a boat, they don't like to use that word, but it's a marine vessel that travels on our rivers. Um, we load up that with the digested solids and then they go to a centralized one of the other treatment plants that has dewatering equipment. So that's what we use for we call dewatering is a centrifuge. So we spin that 3% solids liquid into what we call a biosolids cake. That's about 25% solids. And that's what you saw the picture of in the video on the belt. It looked like little um, dark um, soil or mudish type material. We call that biosolids cake. Um, that we produce about 12 to 1400 tons a day of in New York City. Um, and one, my other main job at DEP besides the co-digestion program is getting those biosolids out of the landfills. Um, we started landfilling um, biosolids after the financial crisis because of um, budget constraints and um, we're slowly ramping back up. So we're doing about 30% beneficial use of our biosolids now with a goal to have 100% beneficial use uh, by 2030. So that's what we call the solids portion of the train. When we centrifuge that uh, solids and we make the cake, 
the liquid that comes off of the centrifuge goes back to the beginning of the treatment process and through the treatment plant again. So that water will eventually be disinfected and discharged to um, the East River or the Hudson River, depending on which um, treatment plant it's it's going to. So, uh, and then the biogas, that would be the third product, right, of digestion. Biogas is about um, 50 to 60% methane. Uh, the other significant portion is CO2, which someone mentioned. Um, we, we do not have a method to capture the CO2. The CO2 is released into the atmosphere. Pretty similar to with composting, though, there's a good amount of CO2 that is released when you, you're, you're degrading organic matter. Um, but the, the proportion in this case that's converted to methane and is recoverable is actually higher when we add food waste. So we did a study with Manhattan College and they measured the biogas and they looked at how much methane was in the biogas and the food waste actually increased the amount of methane. And for those of you who really wanna get in on the scientific details and may be members of NIWEA, which is the New York Water Environment Association, there's a nice article in their magazine called Clear Waters that talks about our research project with Manhattan College on that. So, I mean, long-term there's folks who are dabbling in CO2 recovery, right? To like capture CO2 and use it for carbonation or other industrial processes. And I think that, you know, that'd be something DEP would really like to look into into the future, but it's still emerging. Um, and it's not something that we're doing right now. I hope um, I answered all of the parts of that question. I have I have a few more questions about those biosolids that just came in. Yeah. Um, and they're just whether or not the biosolids are actually fully digested before they get landfilled or if they decompose anaerobically in the landfill. Um, and then if not a landfill, where should the biosolids go? Um, and what is the beneficial use of that biosolid? Yeah, um, sure. I mean, there are organic materials that will continue to degrade. Um, some carbon takes longer, um, but that's one of the, you know, real challenges with landfills is that material will degrade in there for 15 to 20 years. So yes, there is um, continued anaerobic degradation of biosolids that are landfills. It's one of the you know, primary drivers why the city wants to um, you know, shift course again and get back to beneficial use. Um, as far as beneficial use, you know, when, they're, when biosolids are composted, they can be used for you know, lots of things that compost can be used for, top dressing golf courses and ball fields or doing roadside repairs or doing uh, horticulture, landscaping. Um, you know, I think it really depends on the product that's being made. In this, in this case, um, compost is one of the primary products. Um, another project that DEP has done a lot of work on is mine land reclamation. So using biosolids to go to disturb lands that were either coal mines or other types of mineral mines and try to um, improve the soil and revegetate them um, for more productive use. So that's another example. Very interesting. Um, uh, I have a few other questions. So um, what are, how are the non-food waste items like paper and compostable plastics, how are those managed? Um, so in the setup where waste management is making the slurry, those would be segregated out and they'd probably end up in, in a landfill. Um, you know, with things like compostable silverware, um, they're not ideal for digestion and they're usually big enough that they end up getting screened out. Um, that said, if they're broken into pieces during processing and some of the pieces end up in the digester, they'll probably continue to break down. Um, and then if they ended up in the biosolids in like smaller and smaller pieces, you know, and then the biosolids are composted, you know, they'll start to break down. But um, that's one area that, you know, if any of you happen to be in biodegradable product work, which I know some of you are, um, <laughs> this question of how do you make things that might be good for digestion as well as composting, that is a space to watch, I'd say. Uh, but for now, most of them are designed for industrial composting facilities, you know, ones that operate with a lot of mechanical um, action to break them into smaller pieces and then pretty high temperatures to encourage uh, accelerated degradation, right? You can't compost compostable forks in your backyard. It doesn't really work. So, yeah. Um, another question I have on that collection process is that, um, so 
someone's wondering if the organics from the brown bins are all of them going to di digestion or some of them going to composting? Um, that's not really a question for me, right? It's a question for DSMY. <laughs> um, but I think the answer is no. You know, I think they're going to multiple locations and a lot of it would have to do it, it as far as I understand with, you know, trying to be efficient, right? If you have a full truck, where's the, you know, most nearby place to empty it, right? Because we don't want to be driving a lot. That's part of, uh, I think, one of the goals in city waste management is to reduce truck traffic. So, yeah. But no, I don't think that, I, I can say based on how much we're getting today, <laughs> no, they're not all coming here. <laughs> um, one other question I have is on the calculations of the, how much yield you're getting in terms of biogas per ton of food waste. Um, is there a CHP system involved to convert the biogas to electricity for national, the National Grid Partnership? Or is that biogas going to be used? Where is it going to be used uh, primarily? Yeah, so the conversion rate is highly debatable. Um, and it, it sounds like whoever this question is, you should track down that Clearwater study and read the Manhattan College report. Or if you know Manhattan College, reach out to Rob Sharp and um, speak with him. He was the principal investigator. Um, I was involved in that research project. I can tell you again, based on how large DEP's um, system is here, uh, it's very hard for us to track down the specific contribution. We really struggled um, to pinpoint it because when we add the food waste, we add it to three of the eight digesters, not all eight, but even then we're spreading it out, you know, so there's a little bit in each one and we can't actually figure out how much goes in each one because we feed each set from that same wet well. So it gets pretty complicated. Um, and, but we have looked at a lot of other studies. So as I said, we're not the only utility doing co-digestion. Um, Greater Lawrence Sanitary District in Massachusetts outside Boston is doing this. They have great data. They're one of my favorite projects to reference. So if people could look to that project for some more uh, information. Um, East Bay Mud, um, that mud means municipal utility district out, um, I think they're in uh, Northern California and then there's LA County in Southern California. Again, lots of um, different utilities around the country who are getting into this space. and a good amount of published data that DEP has been referencing to say, you know, we know that food waste is really degradable. It's very, it degrades really fast because it hasn't been digested like um, sewage has, right? Sewage has already been digested by humans. When we put food waste in the digester, it's kind of the first pass through any kind of stomach. Um, so it breaks down pretty well. And we see a, a high conversion rate into um, biogas and, and water. Um, with just a little bit of residual solids. To answer the question about um, the, the biogas, so the gas to grid project, and there was a quick snippet of some infrastructure in the video you could see, and you could see the um, label digester gas, but that whole image is of the biogas conditioning system that National Grid has built on DEP's property that's currently being commissioned. So that's actually not a combined heat and power unit. It's um, a biogas cleanup system. So it's going to take that biogas from the digesters and remove the CO2, remove siloxanes, H2S, other things that it needs to be purified. And then it's gonna be put in the grid essentially as a substitute for fossil natural gas. Um, it's not being compressed for vehicle fuel. It's just gonna go in as um, a replacement for natural gas. We, the video did mention that we use biogas in the boilers. What's really interesting about using biogas in boilers is you don't have to do anything. You can use it straight. You don't have to clean it up. You don't need a combined heat and power unit. You can just put biogas in our boilers. So that's our first step. And we're gonna to continue to do that even when the gas to grid project's fully commissioned. Um, we'll continue to use it because we have to keep those digesters at at least 98 degrees all year round. So we have a pretty significant heating demand um, in, in that. In, you know, in itself. So that's somewhat of a, a feedback loop, right? Where we're using the biogas to keep the digesters warm to make more biogas. Cause the bugs are pretty happy between 98 and hundred. Um, so we like to keep them nice and warm. So I have another question on uh, GHG emissions from co-digestion compared to um, greenhouse gas emissions from composting. Yeah, well, that's something that um, we, um, don't have 
great models for is what I will say. So we, meaning DEP, has um, started to explore this a little bit. Um, the water, oh gosh, I think it was the water Environment Research Foundation, they've changed their name a few times, so forgive me. But in 2012, there was a study that came out that showed that co-digestion was kind of had the best greenhouse gas footprint of all different kinds of organics management options, landfilling versus composting versus, I think they looked at sewering. Um, but that was in 2012. I'd say our, our understanding of greenhouse gas emissions has certainly evolved since then. Um, so this is something we'd like to take a closer look at. Um, the models that are available, things like the warm model for people who might know that from EPA, um, that you could use to try to model, you know, what the greenhouse gas emissions are from these different choices, but it's very dependent on the data you put into the model, right? Like what else is going on in your area? What type of energy is in the nat in the grid? Um, in some cases, transport might factor in, right? Are you driving something a long distance in order to um, dispose of it, and then you're making methane, and then your footprint's going to look pretty bad. So um, I guess I'd like to know more about this, as it sounds like the audience would, and I, I anticipate it's something we're going to um, continue to um, see information come out as more and more, you know, municipalities and cities try to figure this out, right? Like, what's the best thing to do um, from a climate perspective? Okay, so we only have a couple more minutes. Um, and I want to end it on this note, um, just about when in-person tours of the digester eggs will start again. <laughs> um, what can we do to raise more awareness of the program? Um, how are you guys marketing this? Is there any educational information for schools um, and any other materials that they can the audience can share with their communities? Yeah, I mean, thank you again for having me here today because, you know, I kind of got the sense we need to do a little bit more outreach about our program. So um, hopefully we can find more things like that. You know, again, the Medium article is is out there. Please share it. You know, it, um, you've put something in my mind. I probably need to work with DP to get more information on our website um, if people are looking for it. But if you have sp specific suggestions, love to hear them. Um, you know, I will give a nod to our partner Waste Management. Um, they have great information on their website as well, just about how they pre-process the food scraps. Um, so th that can be a resource too, um, but if there's a way you can track me down, I guess. And if you have suggestions, love to hear them and appreciate the, the feedback that there could be you know, more done to add, about, uh, get the word out and, and continue to share the story. Um, as far as the tours, ooh, I don't know if I can, I don't have an answer on that one. You're gonna have to like monitor the DP website or, or I guess like uh, LinkedIn or something. Maybe we announce it on there, um, but they'll come back, they'll come back. Well, thank you so much for your time and all of this great information. Um, it was so nice to learn about co-digestion and, and you know how it is such a good complement to um, the other processes we have in place to get rid of food waste. Um, so thanks for your time and thanks everyone for tuning in. Yeah, thanks very much.